Are you ready? Sure. Self intro. Okay. So, my topic today is on sleep disorders in the geriatric population. Yet, as I was doing this presentation, it's pretty applicable to most people. So, take notes for yourself if you'd like. Um, the objectives of today's presentation is, one, to recognize some of the more common causes of sleep disturbance in the elderly population. Um, I really just kind of hit on a couple of the main ones. There's a lot of rare disorders like narcolepsy. You know, we, we don't necessarily see that often. Um, to understand the importance of good sleep hygiene, um, just at, you know, creating an environment that's more conducive to sleep. To understand the common side effects that are associated with the use of sleeping aids in the elderly, and as well as you know being able to just develop a sleep regimen that can utilize both like behavioral therapy, the non-pharmacologic methods, as well as pharmacologic. So the different types of sleep disorders. So I've highlighted some of the, the ones that I'm going to hit on today. So insomnia, that's probably our biggest one that we see in-house, we see outpatient, we see nursing homes. So parasomnias, that is more having to do with like uh, arousal from sleep, and so I'm not gonna talk too much about that. And then the hypersomnia is at the central origin, origin, that's more your narcolepsy type pictures. So again, rarer, so I'm not gonna talk about that. The circadian rhythm disorder, so that, that would be jet lag, that is kind of typical for anybody who is changing uh, um, time zones. And then of course, the sleep-related breathing disorders, such as sleep apnea, and the movement disorders, like restless leg syndrome. So I actually want to start by talking about insomnia. So insomnia is any type of difficulty in either initiating sleep or maintaining sleep that ends up negatively impacting your overall quality of rest. So there's different classifications for insomnia. The first being acute insomnia. So that's something I had last night in preparation for this <laughs> presentation. So what that means is for whatever reason, you're stressed, you had some big event happening in your life, you crammed so much for a test now you just can't sleep, that maybe one night of sleep is is effective and then you go back to your regular schedule once your life settles down. Um, typically, we don't treat for that. It usually just resolves spontaneously once the stressor is gone. For chronic insomnia, this is something more long-standing. Um, to qualify for the, t the title of chronic insomnia, you have to have at least three nights per week that your sleep is impaired over a course of at least more than three months. And this has to kind of be insomnia that's not related to another underlying disorder. So that brings me to comorbid insomnia. So this is um, difficulty sleeping because of this, another condition, whether this be um, a psychiatric condition, a medical condition, or just something that you're doing to your body. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as I go on. So then that's further broken down into this, the, the, the timing of your insomnia. So the issue is that you're having difficulty just initiating sleep. You just can't fall asleep. That would be considered onset insomnia. If you're able to fall asleep, but then find you're awake at 2 in the morning, you just can't go back to sleep, suggests that you just can't maintain your sleep. That's maintenance insomnia. So I thought I'd throw this in here, culture it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, Los Capricos from by uh, Francisco de Goya. The sleep for reason produces uh, the sleep of reason produces monsters, nightmares, can't sleep. Yeah. Um, so some modifiable risk factors for insomnia. So as I mentioned, the comorbid insomnia could be secondary to psychiatric conditions. So anxiety, stress, if somebody's depressed, they've got a lot on their mind, it's very difficult to get sleep. Um, if they've had a recent loss, they're having bereavement or some sort of adjustment disorder. Medical conditions that can cause difficulty sleeping would be like Parkinson's disease, uncontrolled pain. If you have somebody who has arthritis, chronic lower back pain, they're just not able to lay flat. If you can't get into a comfortable enough position to sleep, then of course you're not going to fall asleep. 
nocturia. This is something very common in the geriatric population. If they have um, their prostate is enlarged and they're having to get up to the bathroom 10 times a night, chances are they're not going to be in bed long enough at any given time that they're going to get into a deep, comfortable sleep. So something like GERD, if uh, the reflux disease, so if if they're having a lot of burning or it's making them cough all night, again, it's really hard to get to a nice, comfortable uh, sleep. So dyspnea, whether that be from heart failure, whether that be um, from some sort of lung disorder, if you're having trouble getting good oxygen, that's going to wake you up a lot in the night as well. And then paresthesias. If you've got, you know, pins and needles going down your legs, that's definitely going to keep you awake too. So, now I want to take it over to the medication side. It's a lot of things on this list. And so, if you look at this, it's like, well, some of these you just can't get rid of, right? Like, if somebody is on diuretics and they need it, so that way they can't get the volume, you know, they need it to breathe. You know, you've got two conflicting things that you just can't completely do away with. Um, the methyl dopa, levodopa, you've got somebody with Parkinson's. That, you know, you want to treat the Parkinson's, but the medicine itself can actually make the, Parkin the, the insomnia worse. Um, so the best thing to do, we may not be able to remove some of these risks, but try to minimize the medication such and treat the underlying conditions that we can try to improve sleep overall. Some other modifiable risk factors. Caffeine. So caffeine can actually stay in the body and kind of keep you ramped up for actually 20 hours after you've taken it. So if you've got your, your little old lady who's like, well, I had a pot of coffee, but it was before noon, so it's fine. It actually could very well be keeping her them pretty wired um, when it comes time to go to bed teas, sodas, you know, taking that into account. Chocolate. So chocolate. <laughs> we don't think about chocolate, no. but it actually does have a fair bit of caffeine, and so we've got to take into account chocolate consumption when we're trying to figure out what sort of issues can be contributing to somebody's um, insomnia. And then medications and diet pills. I'm hoping none of my geriatric or geri my little geriatric patients are on diet pills, but you never know, it doesn't hurt to ask. The medications are something to consider is folks who have chronic migraines, the Fiora set that has that combined caffeine and Tylenol mixture, like that could be a source of caffeine that they're just not aware of. So it's good to look into what all they're taking. Excuse me, what was that again? The like Fiora set, that, yeah. It's, I forget what the third thing is. It's like, it's Tylenol, caffeine, and Zutel. <laughs> That's yeah. what it is. Thank you. So alcohol. Folks mm -hmm. love to drink alcohol to go to bed. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I'll just have a couple of beers to wind down. And in truth, it does, it is a depressant. And so it'll help you to fall asleep. So folks who have initi trouble initiating sleep, it's great. But it actually wears off in a couple of hours and you kind of have this rebound insomnia so you'll wake up in the middle of the night and can't fall back asleep and so it actually is causing more harm than good and so educating patients to try to minimize alcohol consumption especially before bed um, it's hard because like i said well dog it makes me fall asleep but trying to explain that it's just a temporary thing nicotine we do see a lot of smoking yet still in the geriatric population. Nicotine is a stimulant, and it does stay in the body for longer periods of time. And so it could very well be contributing to, to the insomnia as well. And then illicit drugs. Anything that's going to act as a stimulant can, can affect one's sleep. So when somebody starts having complaints of insomnia, and we've corrected the medicines and the underlying medical conditions that we can, we have to start looking for things that we can change you know, in their lifestyle to try to make it a little bit easier for them to fall asleep. So we need to have a little bit better control of like the stimuluses. So during the daytime, 
if you, especially like in a nursing home type setting, you're here in the hospital, if it's morning, get up. <laughs> like, don't lay in bed. You've got to have like a scheduled wake up time. Um, if, you know, have the blinds open, the sun needs to be coming in, you have to have those cues that tell you, okay, wake up. Um, things like regular exercise, things that keep your, your body going are, are really good. I don't, you know, you shouldn't try to exercise too much too early before bed because then it kind of gets you going then it's hard to fall asleep. But during the day, it's great. Um, bright light exposure, like I said, you want to minimize naps. Because if you nap two hours here, nap another hour here, nap 30 minutes here, you are going to be rested come 9, 10 o'clock at night. You're not going to want to go to sleep. And so then you end up repeating this cycle. My, my boyfriend is studying for his boards right now. And he is just in the worst cycle. He comes home and naps until like midnight. And then he studies for several hours. <laughs> And then in the morning, he's you know doesn't want to go to, doesn't want to go to work because he's so tired, and so we're trying to break the nap. <laughs> um, so once you're in that cycle, it's hard to break because it's just what your body wants to do. Um, and then of course avoiding the things I mentioned earlier like caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. If your patient is not willing to give these things up, at least maybe push them to earlier in the day so that way they you know the chemicals may have left the the system and it won't be so stimulating um, during the nighttime. Just as I had said, a scheduled wake up time, also a scheduled bedtime. Um, maybe a light snack before bed. If you go to bed hungry, your stomach's grumbling, you're thinking about food, you're not going to fall asleep. And then the, uh, the, moreover, like if you've had a big heavy meal and you're digesting, that may keep you up too. So, Avoid reading or watching TV in bed. So, if you're during during medical school, I wanted to read all the Harry Potters. And if anyone's read the Harry Potter books, they know once you start, you can't stop. And so, you're pretty much a zombie for two weeks mm -hmm. because you're like, I don't need to sleep. I keep reading. So, if you're reading something or watching something that you really don't want to turn off, then it's going to be harder to shut your brain off once once you close that book or turn off that that show. Develop a sleep ritual, and this is going to be different for each person. Um, you know, if your ritual is taking a nice warm bath before bed, maybe having a little bit of just quiet time where all the noise is off, the lights are off, um, just kind of developing your routine so that way your, you know, your body kind of get, gets used to settling down. Creating a comfortable <coughs> environment. So, you know, if any little bit of light bothers you, dark curtains, uh, uh, making sure that it's the nice, right temperature. I love to sleep in cold, cold rooms so I can bundle up. If the room's too hot, I'll be thrashing around. But I know some people like it warm, so making sure the environment is comfortable for you. And then, and then white noise. Some folks need absolute silence to fall asleep. I like the... There's like the, the rain sounds and the, the jungle sounds. So Spotify actually has like a sleep radio station, and I'll keep that going kind of low for myself. But it, it, for some people, it's you know they need that kind of something soft in the background. So then something else to try would be like sleep restriction. So what this does is you want to reduce the total time in bed so that it. It, when you're in bed, you're sleeping, okay? So you set, like, okay, I'm gonna stay in bed and sleep for five hours. If you're not asleep, get up, the, and then walk around until you're a little bit more tired. The goal being that you are going to get it so that the ratio of time in bed and time asleep is greater than 90%. Um, you're, and then you have the patient kind of work up in increments of maybe 15, 30 minutes, every week or so, okay, I'm going to stay in bed a little bit longer, or sleep a little bit longer. And then, of course, there are relaxation techniques. So I've talked to a lot of people about that, the progressive muscle relaxation, so kind of focusing from, like, the bottom up. So 
you, you know, thinking about your toes and your toes falling asleep and creeping your way up and thinking about different body parts falling asleep and, so, and you know, sometimes you, you won't even get to the head before you're <laughs> zonked out. So, it's like counting sheep. It'll eventually help you to doze off. Meditation, hypnosis, um, does anyone have any tricks they use? I was an insomniac all through college, so, so I've, I've had to come up with tricks of my own. <clears throat> I, um, I heard about the, you tense the muscle and then relax it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'll tell people to start with their feet and then kind of work their way out, mm -hmm. tensing different muscle groups, um, mm -hmm. and then relaxing them. Because I tried that for myself and it kind of worked, like all my tension is here. So it kind of helps me relax my head and neck over back. Anybody else have any fun tricks? No. You'll find that you know things that work for other people don't work for you know others. I mean, the uh, they always recommend to drink a warm glass of milk before bed. I'm lactose intolerant, so if I drink a warm glass of milk before bed, I would not be sleeping. So. <laughs> Some, like I said, I like noise, some people like quiet. Actually, in college, I would leave my TV on and would have this sleep timer set. And it would, the noise would be down so much that I couldn't necessarily hear it. It'd be like a, like having the peanuts, the, the teacher, like, you know, you couldn't actually discern words, but like the flashing lights kind of soothed me. So. I don't know, but some people they can't have that. It's too it's too stimulating. I like to I like yeah. to read. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, and usually it's not one of those dashing novels or anything like that. And you know, I read about ten or fifteen minutes and mm -hmm. you know, I'm ready to go. After my shower and those types of uh -huh. things. I find reading things. textbooks are like <laughs> <laughs> like I'm gonna read this textbook now. <laughs> That'll knock me out pretty soon. Or like a like whole soil put me to bed, but like anything that's like suspenseful, you just really can't wait until the end, yeah. <laughs> it's not a good plan. <laughs> so sometimes though, despite our best attempts and our patients' attempts to you know make modifications, we have to bite the bullet and talk about medications. So unfortunately all of the known all the agents that we use are known to increase the risk of falls which, as we know, occur in about a third of our geriatric population. And so if we have somebody who already is falling, I usually try to avoid starting anything. Um, you always want to use the lowest effective dose. Like anything in geriatrics, uh, start low, go slow. Um, and then, of course, these medicines are not meant to be chronic. They shouldn't be on their medication list for years and years and years. This is for short courses of treatment, and so it should only be ordered as such. And then never, ever, ever tell your patients or family members to go to the store and get over-the-counter antihistamines, the bedtime dosage, because there's other medications there, especially in the geriatric population, that they could react poorly to. And so, I I agree, and I was really surprised once I got into practice the number of patients that are taking, and they'll just call it Tylenol or Advil, mm -hmm. and you have to really ask. And I'll say, why do you take that every night? And I'll say, well, it helps me go to sleep. And I'll say, oh, well, is it Tylenol PM? Oh yeah, you know. So they don't even really think of it as a medication, you know. And they all have Benadryl or Benadryl derivatives, in them, which can really. Mm -hmm. So I I learned the hard way to really, to, you know, I thought because. Some patients I would assume it was regular Tylenol. And I was like, wait a minute, you take it at night? And oh, it's Tylenol PM, you know, so you do have to, that's gonna be an inordinate number of people have sleep problems and they're all gonna try to solve it themselves. And most, a lot of them are gonna get um, the PM medications. Mm -hmm. no. So understanding the type of insomnia they have is also gonna play into what medications you're gonna wanna order. Um, for example, if the issue is that they're having trouble just falling asleep, you would perhaps want to use something that's more short acting because once they're asleep, they stay asleep, right? So you don't necessarily need to have them doped up through the night. Um, somebody who has trouble maintaining sleep, they're like, Doc, I'm waking up at 3 a.m., I don't know what to do, I can't go back to sleep. 
you'd want something more long acting. The initiating sleep usually isn't the issue with them, and so something that's going to stay in the system a little bit longer. Unfortunately, the long acting stuff, some of them really are quite long, and so come morning time, they're still very drowsy, and so we have to be careful with that as well. And then, of course, like with a lot of medicines, you can't just stop, you know, willy nilly. It, they should kind of be discontinued gradually because there can be some rebound insomnia with some of these. And then you're back to square one. So, I'm just going to highlight a couple of the medications that we use here, some things to consider. So, melatonin is usually what I like to start in with our, start with for our geriatric patients. So, melatonin. Um, it is something that's really not FDA approved, um, it's the natural supplement. Our pineal gland actually makes melatonin, um, and it's actually synthesized from tryptophan, which as we all know, turkeys, tryptophan, sleepy Thanksgiving. Um, so the thought is that melatonin naturally plays a large role in sleep and our circadian rhythms because Studies have shown that there's high levels of melatonin in our body during the night. And so, um, you can get this over the counter. VA ha the VA has it as a non-formulary, so we're able to use it for some of our folks. Um, how effective it is, I can't say. Some people swear by it. I've used it, and when I did the OB rotation where I had to switch back and forth between days and nights, and I don't think it helps me, um, but some people it does. And so I think it's worth a try. It's a lot less risky than some of the other medications that we have. Um, I'm gonna like butcher half of these things, sorry guys. The Ramalteon. Can I say one of the things? Um, okay. <clears throat> I do think like it's one that you have to take routinely before it's gonna be effective. So a lot of my patients, um, we'll try it once or twice. If you don't counsel them appropriately, they'll take it once or twice and then and say, oh, I tried melatonin, it didn't work for me. Well, it's not really a PRN kind of deal. Um, so uh, most of my folks, I would say, well, why don't you try this for like a two or three week period and then we'll see if it is helpful for you. But I agree, a lot of sleep clinics will actually use it as their first line medication um, for sleep, but you have to take it routinely. Sorry, no, of course. No, that's a good point, because I know Kristen told us the same. Um, she taught us that melatonin, you know, will start working or seeing, you'll see the effects within four to six weeks. That's a long time. So, Ramelteon, this is a melatonin receptor agonist. And so, it actually, it's a, synth it's a synthesized drug that actually has a higher affinity for that receptor. Mm -hmm. And so, it's sh it has been shown to improve some parts like some sleep parameters, but overall doesn't appear to be all that effective. It's kind of like melatonin. Some studies say it's helpful, some don't. Overall, you know, we're, we're not sure. <laughs> um, it, it, studies have shown that it uh, helps more with the onset of sleep than it does maintenance. Um, so Zolpidem, Ambien, which we, ha which we usually have here at the VA, um, it is one of the non-benzodiazepines that we use for sleep. It's a GABA agonist. Um, it has a pretty short half-life, at least the regular result of them. There is a uh, long-acting formulation. But the half-life of the regular one is like one and a half to two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And so it's really only going to help with that initiation of sleep. Um, we, and I'll go through kind of the general side effects, but this is known to cause some headaches and just dizziness, and um, of course can lead to falls. Um, the azopiclon or Lunesta, so I have the generics there, mm -hmm. the brands there, so I say this a little better. The Lunesta actually has, a, it's of all of these has the longest half-life. Its half-life is five to seven hours. I don't sleep five or seven hours every night, so like that just seems a bit much. Um, so people complain about um, an unpleasant metallic taste, um, and then in the morning there's a lot of kind of like drowsiness. They're kind of impaired. So I guess if you know you're 
Aiming for nine, ten hours, then this is the medication for you. But I mean, you can imagine most of our geriatric patients, this really wouldn't be all that safe because we tend to not sleep that many hours during the night for one thing. And the last thing you want is for them to get up in the morning and fall because they're mm -hmm. disoriented. Disoriented. So, trazodone is one of the antidepressants that we use regularly. It has sedating properties, and it's thought to be because it targets the central anticholinergic and um, antihistamine receptors. And so um, as this medication is good if your patient has like a component of depression. And so that way you're maybe killing two birds with one stone. Um, but again, high risk of falls and delirium. And then I add benzos. <laughs> Because benzos serve a purpose, but they really, really should be your last, last, last line of defense. Because we know that the side effect profile, especially in uh, the geriatric population, is, is really bad. But I can say that the benzos target the GABA receptors as well. They, they do help to decrease the time of, on, or time of onset to sleep. Um, they do prolong stage two sleep, they prolong the total sleep time. They, if you have somebody who has like an anxiety component, it does help with that. Um, and if, or somebody who has like anti-convulsive issues, that can help as well. So there are going to be a certain population of people who we consider benzos in, again, short term only. Um, but I, I can't stress enough these are the, the most dangerous ones in our population. Yes? You know, I'm just wondering, because I don't know a lot about the effects on mm -hmm. the person with sleep, but well, how does that affect their REM? You know, will they really get a good night's sleep, or is it that they are just... Knocked out. Knocked out, <laughs> yeah. So, you know? from what I gathered, I know the benzos actually decrease the overall amount of REM sleep. I'm not sure about the other, the non-benzos. But I know, yeah, the benzos aren't great for them. Question mm -hmm. for yeah. melatonin, mm -hmm. what's the dose? I want to um, say they usually start around three milligrams. I think you can buy anywhere from one to 10 milligram tablets on oh, really? the counter, and I usually tell my patients two to three milligrams. Yeah. What do you get? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think the non-formulary. Mm -hmm. I get the 40. No. Uh, mm -hmm. Microgram. How much? Milligram? 40. 40? Microgram. Oh, which is like 4. Nine. 4. Right? Yeah. No, 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 no point. Point. I'm like, no. Yeah. 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 Ye
because a lot of it comes down to what are they doing before they go to bed. Mm -hmm. And they're not too keen on, on telling you the nitty gritty details. And of course, you know, your patients don't want you to be mad at them. So, you know, they're going to water it down for you. So, but having those conversations about good sleep hygiene is very important. So kind of the general adverse reactions, and these are what we're going to see more with the sedating medicines, with the benzos, with even the, the non-benzos. Excessive sedation is something that we worry about. We don't want someone to be so somnolent that they're not waking up in the morning. Um, cognitive impairment and delirium. Especially with the benzos, we can see a lot of delirium, a lot of agitation. And so and it takes, the because of how um, we have a lot more fat in our geriatric instead of muscle, it, it's hard for the body to get rid of it because the, the medicine likes to stay in the body. Mm -hmm. And so something that you know we would have gotten over, you know, an average person would have gotten over in a couple of hours, you could still be seeing effects from that like the next day. Um, nighttime wandering, especially if you have somebody who lives alone, um, has you know stairs in their house, you know you, you don't know what kind of trouble they can get into. So you have to be very careful with that. And I've seen that a lot with like with like Benadryls. Um, um, and then of course balance problems and falls. If you're wake, if you're waking up, you're so a little disoriented, you're more inclined to fall. Um, and then just again difficulty performing your ADLs, IADLs. We want people to stay at home as long as possible, but if they're you know, not able to take care of themselves, then that's going to make that not happen. So management. Overall, behavioral, behavioral therapy should be the first line, period. Before you even start thinking about anything, you should always try to fix what we can fix. Um, the combination of both behavioral therapy and like pharmacologic therapy is going to be more effective than either alone. That being said, that to maintain good improved sleep, it's best to keep doing that behavioral therapy, but to stop the, the medications. As I mentioned earlier, these medicines are meant to be used short term only. Melatonin, that one's okay. <laughs> but the other ones, you know, we want, we want short term courses of treatment. I'm switching gears, so any thoughts on, any more thoughts on insomnia before I move on to something else? I don't know if you made this point, I'm sorry to keep bringing this up, but so I've had more than a few patients and their families come in complaining of insomnia, but I think you have to get a good history, because when you delve into it, they'll say, well, mom goes to bed just fine around nine, but she wakes up about four in the morning. Well, <clears throat> that's seven hours of sleep, right? Am I doing my math? Mm -hmm. um, and, some elderly folks are only going to sleep six to seven hours overnight, and so I'm not sure that is insomnia. If somebody goes to sleep and sleeps, you know, six to seven hours, um, we tend to just need less sleep as we age, and so you just sort of have to sometimes edge it. Families will be wanting a medication because they want their mom to sleep until eight when they get up to get everybody ready to go to work yeah. in school. And you know, I just you just have to say, you know, it's not really realistic for you know, 89 year old person to sleep nine to ten hours overnight. So it's important. Just like in GI, you know, one person's diarrhea is another person's gratification. And with sleep, you have to kind of define the problem. Um, because I know, I'll be honest, in more than one case, I probably put someone on a medic, you know, was ready to write the prescription, you know, um, without really getting a real picture of what was going on. Well, and then that's where, like, the daytime napping comes in, too. Because mm -hmm. my grandma loves to watch her soaps while she's passed out on the couch. Um, and then she, she's also up with chickens at 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. because she's well rested. So, um, so I, you know, I wouldn't put her in, mm -hmm. on a sleeping pill either because clearly she's getting enough rest. Um, okay, so switching gears. I want to talk a little bit about sleep apnea. Um, we do still see this in this population. Um, sleep apnea is defined as repeated episodes of apnea or cessation of the airflow for greater than 10 seconds during sleep. Um, and this has to be associated with daytime sleepiness or it could alter your cardiopulmonary function. So it could elevate your blood pressure, put more strain on the heart. Um, so there's different classifications of apnea. There's obstructive, which is the most common one that we see, and it's where we have upper airway closure, whether that be because your tonsils are enlarged, your tongue is sliding back in your mouth and blocking the airway, 
um, thick, heavy neck, um, lots of different issues. Um, central uh, apnea has to do with your respiratory effort. There's something in the nervous system that's kind of just stopping your drive to breathe. So it's a whole different beast. And then of course you can have mixed words, you have features of both. Um, I'm going to focus more on the obstructive because that's typically what we see. So risk factors for sleep apnea, there are numerous ones and I mentioned a couple. So the increased neck circumference, men tend to be more affected by this, um, Asian ethnicity, hypothyroidism especially in women, we can see this a lot, obesity, um, if you're a smoker, if there's any um, structural abnormalities as I mentioned earlier, and then of course heart failure and stroke. So the clinical features, usually the patient has no clue this is happening, that they, they just feel like they haven't slept, even though they did go to sleep at the normal time, they woke up at a normal time, they just drain. Usually we have the spouse who's like, oh my gosh, this snoring is killing me. And so you try to get a better history and they're saying, you know what, there are kind of pauses where they don't breathe. And so once you get that history, you start thinking, okay, maybe we need a sleep study. Um, so to confirm that someone has sleep apnea, we do the polysomnography, the sleep studies, where they usually stay overnight in one of the sleep labs and they're all wired up and there's a camera watching them. Um, I know a lot of my patients have said that it's real weird <laughs> to have people watch them sleep, um, but a lot of we, we, you know, a lot of folks get it here at the VA. In fact, so much so that we often have to like, uh, like what's the word, like consult outside of the VA to, to get them done, this is how common this is. And then the, the whether or not they have sleep apnea is determined by the apnea, hypoapnea index. And so that kind of calculates how, how often the number, so the number of episodes they're having um, per hour of sleep. So how often are they having these episodes where they stop breathing? So management. So a lot of times we can manage this with the CPAP, whether that's either with the, the, the mask that goes on the nose, the face, or the little the tongs. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have much experience with wearing one of these, but this is probably one of the most polarizing treatment modalities I've seen in medicine. People either love it, they swear by it, they can't sleep without it, or like they hate it, it's claustro you know, it causes them to be claustrophobic, there's no way you're, we're getting that contraption on them. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how people react to CPAPs. I usually will you know, have, try to educate them and have them just work with it for a little while before they give up. Um, oral appliances, they're better tolerated because they're not as loud and they're not you know, covering your face. Um, these help to keep the tongue in the anterior position so it's not falling back and obstructing the airway um, with the hope being that it improves overall sleep. And then of course there are exercises one can do that can improve symptoms. I didn't really quite research much what all these exercises entail, but something to look into. And then of course any, you know, avoiding alcohol or any sedatives. Um, weight loss can help because if you just are carrying a lot of extra weight on your body, of course it's going to, you know, compress your airway as well. And then lying in a lateral versus supine position. Um, if if you're laying back and all your weight's on you, yeah, it's good. It's a little more for your body to have to to keep that those airways open. And so. In terms of medication, there really isn't a good medicine for sleep apnea, but modafinil can actually help when you're having excessive daytime sleepiness. And this is meant to be used in conjunction with the CPAP, not as a replacement. And then, of course, there are surgical options. I tend to veer away from surgery in, in the elderly population, particularly those that are going to, that are going to require general anesthesia. Um, but there are um, implants for the palate that you can do for mild to moderate disease. Somebody who's had such severe apnea that they're not responding to a CPAP or any other interventions, you can't do a trach. I mean, that to me seems pretty extreme, but it is possible. Oh, it's a big one. Okay, the uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty can be curative 
Um, but it's really, you know, it works in less than 50% of people. Um, and then, of course, in rare, rare cases, depending on what sort of structural abnormalities are causing that sleep apnea, there's maxo maxillofacial surgery. So, I like to see that myself. <laughs> um, okay, so restless leg syndrome. So, this, to, to qualify for this diagnosis, one has to have an, like, Kind of pretty constant urge to move their limbs. Um, a lot of times you have just like the paresthesias, the num numbness, tingling, pins and needles, um, motor restlessness. So folks are pacing around, they're tossing, turning, and they're rubbing their legs together. Um, usually is a description of just a vague discomfort in the legs, especially in the calves. And then oftentimes they'll have these symptoms when they're awake, but it's typically at night when they really kind of flare up. And then the symptoms are usually relieved by movement. So the pain, that discomfort, usually gets better as you wiggle around. But if you're up all night wiggling, that's not good sleep either. So. so there's a lot of things that could be causing this that you have to kind of treat, look out for and treat first, right? So iron deficiency is something that I often forget is a very common cause of restless leg syndrome. So checking some, like a CBC their, and their anemia panel is a really good way to go about treating that. So of course, if they have a per, known peripheral nerve disease or spinal cord disease, uremia, any, if the kidneys aren't working and we have all the toxic chemicals building up that can contribute to some restless leg syndrome, diabetes, Parkinson's, uh, venous insufficiency. So a lot of things we've got to rule out first before we start throwing medications at somebody. Um, again, it's best to try to do things with behavioral therapy before we turn to medications. Uh, again, good sleep hygiene measures, as I mentioned earlier, some limb massaging to kind of get rid of some of that discomfort. And then, of course, sometimes hot, hot or cold baths, depending on your preference, um, can help as well. If we have to go the route of medications, there are dopamine agonists or or uh, carbidopa, levodopa, um, what is it, lopinerol is one that I think we commonly use at the VA for folks who are having um, restless leg syndrome. That's usually the first line. Gabapentin, you know, if it's like a peripheral nerve pain, can provide some relief. And then again, last, last resort, there's benzos, um, benzodiazepine agonists, and then low potency opiates. But these should be used should be used only in like rare like refractory cases, um, and really you're not kind of you're just kind of sedating the person too. So, yeah. so periodic limb movement disorder kind of sounds exactly the same as restless legs, but it's it's different. Um, the diagnostic criteria for this is your this person is having you know they have insomnia, excessive sleepiness. Um, they're having repetitive stereotype limb movement. So they may be like, here's the, the example I use, they're extending the big toe and flexing um, the ankle and knee, and they're doing this multiple times in an hour. They're not really aware of it. It's just what's happening as you sleep. But like sleep apnea, you don't realize you're doing it, but it's keeping you in that state where you're not really asleep and not really awake. So in the morning, you still feel like you haven't rested. Um, they also need to have polysomnography that actually records that they're having more than 15 episodes of these contractions per hour. There can't be any evidence of medical, psychiatric, or other sleep disorders that could account for what's happening. Um, and the treatment is similar to that of restless leg syndrome. So you want to do the behavioral things first. If that doesn't work, then you can turn to, again, the same medicine. So the carbidopa, levodopa, gabapentin, and then of course the refractory medications. I believe, my friends, that, that is it. Any questions? Mm -hmm. The gabapentin, I think that's probably pretty effective with our uh, geriatrics mm -hmm. population, though. Would you want to have a lower dose rather than 
Yeah, I, I, it, it's the same with most things. You want to start low, and if it works at a low dose, then by all means, let's stick with that. Um, one of the roadblocks I kind of run into a lot with geriatrics is a lot of them have kidney disorders as well. Mm -hmm. And so the total amount of gabapentin you can even use is usually pretty low, depending on how bad their kidneys are. And so, yeah, I, I would start low with any of them. You know, a lot of times, you know, we're with uh, Dr. Powers and I and uh, Dr. Espinosa, we do the Greg Connect. And so we get referrals from the, um, you know, the, the PCPs out in the, our rural CBOX. And a lot of times they're just really not familiar, you know, with whether it's gabapentin or some of the other medications, and they just don't know what to do with them. So I'm glad we're a really good resource, you know, to help our veterans that are out there. You know, and, and we're doing training as well, you know, with that, so. Yeah, I think, I think there was a point not too long ago where we kind of just overdid it on the sleep meds. Because I'm seeing a lot of people coming, it's coming to me in clinic who are just demanding a pill. They want a pill, they want to go to sleep, and it's, it's kind of like every visit having that same education, and so kind of starting early and working with our patients early and how to, you know, improve insomnia, improve some of these other um, sleep disorders. I think I've been really helped by, um, this may sound bad, but there have been studies coming out showing, you know, increased mortality and, mm -hmm. you know, that after, you, you know, a woman takes an Ambien at night when she's driving the next day, it's kind of like an intoxicated driver. Mm -hmm. And so those kind of studies help me when I'm talking to patients because I'll say, you know, I understand you might have gotten this for 15 years, but what we're learning and we're getting new information all the time that these medications just aren't as safe as we might have thought. And um, in particular, I find that Ambien is very habit forming. Um, and no matter, no matter what they say on TV, you know, um, <laughs> And so I try to use those, and luckily they're being reported in the news, so patients will hear about them. Or because um, you're right, you know, I think um, some people are like, "Well, my old doctor gave it to me for 20 years," and I say, "Well, I." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just what I've been seeing. Like the A sleep lot. problem that I tend to deal with more is trying to get people off the medicines, mm -hmm. the benzos, the Ambien that they've been on for years. I'm not so much starting people on things, yep. so I'm trying to figure out how to have that conversation and then also how to do it safely, especially with the long-term benzo use, um, to go to sleep at night is uh, a very difficult task. It's a, it's a weekly struggle for me, I would say, that's something that I'm talking about in clinic very frequently. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that can overarchingly cause a lot of the different geriatric syndromes, like the delirium, falls, dementia, right. like they get misdiagnosed or labeled as that, but it's really mm -hmm. the medications we've started for sleep or someone else has started. And this information is applicable to pretty much anybody. And so with you know more warnings in the geriatric population in regards to the medications, of course. And so I think when training physicians and other providers, um, we should talk more about the non-pharmacological therapies um, and kind of trend it, because like I said, I don't think we're going to have much luck convincing the, the older generations that to give up their meds. <laughs> but, yeah. Any other questions? I was going to put a picture of my dog up there. I decided to pull it back. <laughs> 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 so I need seats on the table. Thanks. Do you want me to sign you? It's to this one. Oh, me too. Oh, that's just so fun. I'm coming in this morning. I just never really enjoyed it. Terminate. Appropriate talk for today. <laughs> Thank you.